there are going to be good hunters and hunters that aren't so good. And part of the way, and this is to think of a hierarchy as something other than a dominance hierarchy, because the dominance hierarchy theory is slightly flawed because it implies that the hierarchy is only based on power. Right? But that's not right. Like, if you have a, a hunting party or a building crew or anything like that, a lot of what elevates one man above the other in the dominance hierarchy isn't power, it's competence. You know, so the best hunter has the highest reputation, or the best builder has the highest reputation, or, you know, it depends on, on what the hierarchy is devoted for, but the person who's best at that rises to the top. You know, all other things being equal. And that's often the case even if people don't like them very much. You know, we've done investigations into corporate structures where someone will be approved by a relatively large majority of the people who work for the company because they're hyper-competent, but no one really likes them. You know, and so... You can't really think of that as, as, you know, either a popularity contest or something that's based on power. And I think that a decent hierarchy is almost never based on power. It's based on competence. Now, those two things get tangled up. But, well, so then you think, one of the things that's going to make people um, prone to being successful is to feel some responsibility in relationship to their capacity to attain a goal in a group situation. And I think that's partly the origin of both conscientiousness and guilt and shame. We don't know why people are industrious. We can't figure it out. I have a sneaking suspicion. I told you that maybe part of it is that they, they want to win within a defined framework and that that might be associated with hypergamy. Now, one of the things you see is that there is a gender difference between men and women in relationship to conscientiousness. Not conscientiousness overall, but women are more orderly than men, and men are more industrious than women. And that kind of goes along with the hypergamy. So you remember hypergamy is this tendency that I described already. That it's, it's the case in many, many, among many, many types of creature. Um, so there might be that as a motivation, although I don't, I don't think that you can simply say that men think that if they get successful, they're going to have more luck with women, although that's certainly a conscious realization on the part of many men. I think it's such a deep phenomenon, though, that it's built, it's more like it's built into the motivational system a priori, you know. So, anyways. So that would go on the masculine independence front, but... But we still haven't been able to manipulate that with any, to any great degree. Maybe we're thinking as well that what conscientious people are doing is not so much striving to get to the top as they are trying really hard to stay away from the bottom. And that would go along <coughs> with, the <coughs> with the orderliness, industriousness overlap. You know, say if, if uh, part of what makes you orderly and... and somewhat industrious, is disgust sensitivity, one of the things that you might want to do is flee from the bottom of dominance hierarchies because the bottom of the dominance hierarchy is a bad place to be from the perspective of maintenance of health. Like people at the bottom of dominance hierarchies are, generally speaking, in much rougher shape than the people who are closer to the top. And so part of being industriousness might, want, might be, maybe you're motivated by not wanting to fail and then you might think, well, that's anxiety, but maybe not, you know. Conscientious people, let's say you have someone walking down the street and they encounter a homeless person. Okay, is a conscientious person more or less likely to give the conscientious person money? Or give the, the homeless person, <laughs> <coughs> to give the homeless person money? What do you think? No. no, that's right, no, agreeable person. Ah, they'll give the person money, the conscientious person, especially the one that's sort of hyper orderly, you say, Get a job. And they do that because conscientious people are also more judgmental. And that goes along with, with the, the hierarchical attitude, I think. They, you know, they generally run on the principle that being higher up in the hierarchy is better and that there's something wrong with you from a moral perspective if you happen to be you know, among the failures. And so one possibility is that Part of the reason that conscientious people, industrious people are that way is because they judge themselves quite harshly and they really do not want to fail. But it's not because they're anxious, it's because they're disgusted, self-disgusted by the possibility that they might count among the failures. And so, 
that grounds it in an entirely different motivational system. You know, as soon as you produce a value structure, you produce a hierarchy because people compete towards fulfilling the, you know, they compete towards the end game, and that will immediately produce a hierarchy of, of uh, accomplishment, let's say. And then you might say, well, why would men be particularly motivated to do that? And the answer seems to be because of hypergamy. And hypergamy is the tendency of women to make across or up dominance hierarchies. So the males compete with one another, and they want to because they want to win. <clears throat> and part of the consequence of winning is that they have much more success with women. And that's a primary motivator. So, so that's interesting because it, it, it provides a rationale for supporting a, a relatively structured hierarchy that has nothing to do with, with you know, having to deal with the negative consequences of, of not having a stable worldview. It's more, and you know, there's another thing to think about too here with regards to hierarchies. It's like, if you have an ideal, you immediately have a hierarchy. So if you, because of course, let's say that you have a bunch of children in gymnasium and you say, well, let's do somersaults to the other side of the wall. You know, there's an implication there and the implication is that you can be better or worse at it. And so the kids will immediately compete, especially the boys, will immediately compete to roll to the other side of the wall as fast as they possibly can. And so, if you wanted to get rid of hierarchy, you'd have to get rid of values, and that seems like a really stupid thing to do to me, and, you know, because without values, you have no positive motivation, because you feel almost all your positive motivation in relationship to a goal, right? Because it's not attainment of the goal that makes people happy, generally speaking. It's observation of the fact that their efforts are contributing to them moving towards a valued goal. Of course, if you're conscientious over time, your field of opportunities opens up from an employment perspective, plus your income increases and you've stabilized the environment around you, and so there's less uncertainty in it and more security. And so, you know, it could easily be that conscientiousness has its effect on neuroticism by stabilizing the environment, taking the uncertainty out of it, and then making people not so much really less like lower neuroticism, but just less likely to be anxious and in emotional pain in general. If you have a client who's unconscientious, problem because the person won't do anything that they say they're going to do and so you know generally speaking especially for behavioral therapy what happens is that someone will come in with a problem and you discuss an array of potential solutions and you know an intelligent person could do that better than an unintelligent person and then you decide which of those potential solutions might be implemented and then you wait you know, you don't want to put too much of a burden on the person because you want to make the probability that they'll actually implement the change very high, so you do it quite slowly because people aren't that good at implementing behavioral changes. And then, you know, hopefully the person comes back and says, well, I've tried this, and, you know, here's the outcome, and then you modify it accordingly. It's, that's called, essentially called collaborative empiricism. Um, but the problem with doing that with someone who's unconscientious is they, they'll come back and they'll say, well, I didn't get around to it. It's like, okay, well, what are you supposed to do about that? It's like, if the person doesn't get around to doing things that'll help, how can you get them to get around to doing anything that'll help? It's, it's one of those flaws that seems to interfere with the process itself. You know, now, I could say, well, maybe you could make the person enthusiastic about it and they'd be driven by enthusiasm, which is more of a positive emotion, or maybe you could terrify them half to death by the negative consequences of not doing it, which is also useful, or maybe they're agreeable and so they'd be willing to do it for someone else, like there's other places, or if they're open, you can think of a creative way to do it, there's other places you can get leverage. But, 
without the conscientiousness, there's a real problem. It's really, it's really difficult. Conscientiousness is a good predictor of long-term life success. It's a good predictor negatively of divorce. So more conscientious people are less likely to get divorced. It's a really good predictor of grades. It's a decent predictor of income. It's a good predictor of social status, eventual social status. It seems to be particularly good at predicting outcomes. People who are engaged in managerial, administrative, and process management occupations. And so all of those occupations are characterized by the necessity of reliability, integrity, and um, attention to detail. So overall, if you're conscientious, you're going to be more satisfied with your life, especially as you progress through time, and you're going to be more, more happy you're going to be happier. Which is funny because, of course, happiness is basically extroversion, so you might ask, what does that have to do with conscientiousness? But what it seems to happen is that because you're conscientious across time, your life actually stabilizes and gets better. And so even though you might not be more happy, you'll be less miserable. And I'll tell you, if you give people a choice between less miserable and happier, they'll take less miserable. Because it's really painful to be miserable, but it, it's only so... It's only moderately good to be happy. Like we have a much bigger capacity for negative emotion than for positive emotion.